so thank you for the, uh, for the introduction and for the uh, opportunity to speak here today. I was invited, uh, I take it because I cover edit, um, immigration for the Wall Street Journal editorial page um, where I've worked uh, for about 18 years now and, and been covering, writing Im about immigration for the paper for about uh, 10 or 11 years. Um, and as was mentioned in, in the introduction a few years ago, I wrote this book on immigration, uh, immigration reform. And at the time I wrote the book, I figured I would give, be giving speeches in, in, in places like California and New York and Arizona and other traditional gateway states uh, for immigrants, and I did. But I also found myself uh, getting invitations to speak in places with relatively small percentages of immigrants, places like Arkansas and Pennsylvania and South Carolina, and Tennessee and Iowa. And one of the reasons was that while these places might not have large numbers of immigrants in absolute terms, what they did have is some of the fastest growing immigrant populations in the U.S. And I think this is causing some anxiety around the country. Uh, the foreign-born share of Iowa's population, for instance, is still very small, less than 5 percent. But it's up more than 130 percent in the past two decades. Compare that to a big state like this one, California, where the foreign-born population grew by only 22 percent over the same period of time. Um, so California may have 10 million immigrants, which means its uh, immigrant population is three times the size of Iowa's entire population. But that seems to matter less than the fact that these states like Iowa have been uh, growing their immigrant population so rapidly. Um, like I said, it creates a lot of anxiety, and it has allowed opportunistic politicians and talk radio hosts and cable news folks to play on people's worst fears and prejudices. And one of the reasons I wrote the book is because I don't think people in the media are doing a good enough job of uh, keeping things in perspective, uh, to, put it, to put it bluntly. For example, illegal border crossings peaked in the year 2000 uh, and are down by more than 70% since then. So in this past decade that we've been having this heated discussion about immigration, and illegal immigration in particular, uh, it's been falling by 70%. There's a certain disconnect there between the rhetoric and the reality. Uh, net migration from Mexico is currently zero. Uh, you'd never know that, given the tone of the debate in the country today. Um, but it suggests to me that this is something of a manufactured crisis, that uh, it's not quite the, the, the crisis that it's been made, made out to be. I also wanted to uh, make some fact-based contributions to the debate about how immigrants impact our economy, our politics, and our culture. And the title of the book, of course, is Let Them In. The case for open borders. And the case for open borders isn't a case for erasing the border or ending U.S. sovereignty or any other such nonsense. Uh, the case for open borders is simply a case for allowing the free market to decide how much foreign labor we need in this country. Uh, right now, that determination is made by and large by politicians and public policymakers setting arbitrary immigration quotas. And like most exercises and Soviet style central planning, uh, it hasn't worked. It's been a disaster. Uh, it's left us with thriving markets and human smuggling and document fraud. It's left us with dead bodies in the Arizona desert. And of course, it's left us with 10, 12 million plus illegal immigrants in the United States. So I argue that our public policymakers would do better to put in place free market mechanisms, such as viable guest worker programs that allow the law of supply and demand to determine the level of immigration. Uh, this will help reduce illegal immigration just as it did when we used it after World War II for the Bracero program um, for Mexican farm workers. And for those not familiar with that program, there was a shortage of farm workers uh, following the war. And Washington put in place a program that allowed Mexican farm workers to come work here legally. Um, it lasted from about 1946 to 1964, when the unions basically shut it down because they didn't want the competition from the immigrant workers. But during that period, illegal immigration from Mexico fell by more than 80%. You give people 
more legal ways to come, fewer come illegally. Um, so not only would it help reduce illegal immigration, I think letting the free market and the law of supply and demand do its thing, uh, but I think it would leave us safer from a homeland security standpoint. Uh, instead of chasing down people who come here to burp our babies and mow our lawns and otherwise get a better return on their human capital, our limited homeland security resources could be used to chase down real threats. Under the status quo, the economic migrants are running interference for the bad guys. I'd much rather our border patrol be focused on catching the next Boston bombers instead of harassing the woman who changed the linen at my hotel last night. Right now, they aren't focused exclusively on these real threats. Right now, they're stretched thin, pursuing people who come here to work. It's a very inefficient use of limited resources, and I think it makes this country less safe than we would be otherwise. It's my Marco Rubio impersonation. Now, my experience has been that after I make that argument, the naysayers sort of move the goalpost. Once you explain how increasing legal immigration would be an effective tool in decreasing illegal immigration, the argument shifts to why we don't need the legal immigrants either. Now, the Wall Street Journal's position on immigration is of a piece. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an argument that I happen to share, and that is that we favor free markets and free people, and that includes free and flexible labor markets. And most people, of course, who self-identify as free market conservatives uh, share this belief in freedom. But one glaring exception, in my experience, seems to be when the topic turns to immigration. Um, no self-respecting free market conservative would ever dream of supporting laws that interfere with the movement of goods and services across international borders. But when it comes to laws that hamper the free movement of the workers who produce those goods and services, uh, too many conservatives today, in my view, abandon their free market principles. And one of the reasons I wrote the book is to show that there's no inconsistency in advocating for both free markets and more open immigration policies. And the subtitle of the book is Six Arguments Why Against uh, immigration and why they're wrong. And I chose that subtitle because over the years I'd heard the same anti-immigrant arguments repeatedly. They steal jobs, they depress wages, they're filling our jails and prisons, they're overburdening our welfare state, and so on. Yet time and again my own reporting and research found these claims to be way overblown or simply untrue. And I'll give you a few examples. If your go-to person on immigration is Lou Dobbs, or Rush Limbaugh, you might be convinced that we are in the midst of an illegal immigrant crime wave in this country. Yet the evidence does not support that claim. The evidence today doesn't support it. The evidence going back 100 years doesn't support it. Because many of the immigrants to the US, especially Mexicans and other Central Americans, are young men who arrive with very low levels of formal education, we tend to associate them with higher rates of crime and incarceration but anecdotes can't substitute for empirical data. And the fact is that numerous studies by independent researchers and government commissions over the past century repeatedly have found that immigrants are less likely to commit crimes or be behind bars than the native born. In fact, men between 18 and 39 who comprise the vast majority of the prison population, for them, uh, the incarceration rate of natives is five times higher than that, than the incarceration rate for immigrants. Five times higher. And this is not because law-abiding model immigrants from India and China are compensating for crimes from uh, un undereducated, low-skilled Latino immigrants. This holds true for every ethnic group without exception. Incarceration rates are lowest for immigrants. Mexicans, Salvadorans, Guatemalans, who make up most of the illegal population in this country. It holds true for them as well. Between 1994 and 2005, the illegal immigrant population 
of the U.S. is estimated to have doubled to around 12 million. Yet, according to the Department of Justice, over that same period, violent crime in the U.S. fell by a third. Crimes against property fell by 26 percent. Crime fell in cities with the largest immigrant populations, like New York and L.A. and Chicago and Miami. It also fell in border states with large populations of illegal immigrants, such as San Diego and El Paso. The bottom line is that the problem of crime in the U.S. is not caused or even aggravated by immigrants, regardless of their legal status. But you would never know that listening to some conservatives discuss the subject today. Another widely held belief is that illegal immigrants are stealing jobs from Americans. Again, where is the evidence? Where is the data to support this claim? We had more illegal immigrant immigration, much more, under Bill Clinton and George W. Bush than we've had under Obama, who has set deportation records. Yet we have much higher unemployment today than we had under Bill Clinton or George W. Bush. In fact, and I don't want to suggest that there's a causal relationship here, but studies of U.S. unemployment over the entire 20th century have shown that periods of high immigration have correlated with periods of low unemployment in the U.S. That has been consistently true over more than 100 years of U.S. history. A 100 years that included our highest levels of immigration to America, the early part of the 20th century. One of the reasons for that, as an aside, why immigrants, even illegal immigrants, don't tend to displace U.S. workers is because of the type of people who come here. We're not importing replicas of ourselves. The immigrants who come tend to be either higher skilled or lower skilled than the average American, higher educated or lower educated than the average American. They tend to compete for jobs with one another, not with U.S. natives. That is one of the reasons that uh, the unemployment rate um, is not typically affected by uh, the level of immigration to the U.S. If we were importing replicas of ourselves, it might be a different story, but that is not who tends to come to this country. Another widely held belief is that the rate of Mexican immigration is unprecedented. This, too, is false. Not only is the rate not unprecedented, it isn't even high by historical standards. During the peak years of Mexican immigration in the late 1990s, the U.S. was receiving 1.5 immigrants, legal and illegal, from Mexico each year. 1.5 immigrants per 1,000 U.S. citizens. By contrast, in the middle of the 19th century, the U.S. absorbed an average of 3.6 Irish immigrants per 1,000 U.S. residents annually, or more than double the rate of Mexican immigration at its peak. This holds true for other past immigrant groups as well. From 1840 uh, to 1890, the rate of German immigration was greater in every decade than the current flow of Mexicans. From 1901 to 1910, Italian, Russian, Austro-Hungarian immigration each surpassed the current rate of Mexican immigration. I want to spend the balance of my time talking about assimilation because, as I said at the outset, I think that's the source of a lot of the anxiety we see today. And because many social conservatives, in particular, question whether America is capable of assimilating this latest wave of Latin Americans whether, uh, and whether, in fact, we are doing so. And I'm going to use the Irish immigrant experience as a historical comparison to today's Latinos uh, because, uh, one, there's a lot of similarities, I think, in their stories. And frankly, I've come to believe that if America could assimilate 19th century Irish immigrants, we can probably assimilate anybody. And when your last name is Riley, you can make jokes like that, um, which is also a joke, obviously. Um, we've all heard the stories about no Irish need apply signs in store windows and the like. But I'd like to give you a slightly more vivid portrait of Irish immigration in the 1800s. And it comes from an excellent book by Tom Sowell called Ethnic America. A French traveler in the 1830s returned from a trip that included America and Ireland. 
and he wrote the following. I have seen the Indian in his forest and the Negro in his chains and thought, as I contemplated their pitiable condition, that I saw the very extreme of human wretchedness. But I did not then know the condition of unfortunate Ireland. Now this was not an exaggeration on the part of this writer. Slaves in the US had higher life expectancy than the Irish peasants who immigrated here. Slaves also ate better and lived in cabins built with sturdier materials and better ventilation. Like other early immigrant groups, the Irish came over in the holds of cargo ships, which were built with little regard for the needs of actual passengers. There were no toilet facilities, for instance, so filth and odor and disease were common. In 1847, about 20% of Irish immigrants fleeing the potato famine died en route to the US or shortly after they arrived here. By comparison, the loss of life of slaves traveling on British vessels in the 19th century averaged about 9%. Why was the Irish death rate more than double that of slaves? Simple, it was economics. Those slaves were property. Someone had a stake in keeping them alive. No one cared what happened to these Irish immigrants. It's also worth noting that the Irish were coming from a country that was more than 80% rural, yet they were settling in cities like New York and Boston and Philadelphia. And they met resistance from those who said, America has no use for this unskilled labor. The argument was that we were in the middle of an industrial revolution. The future was factories, not farms, and the Irish would never assimilate to an urban capitalist society. Of course, the naysayers were wrong. The Irish did, the US did have a need for this unskilled labor. And this increase in workers did not go to waste. Supply created its own demand. Another thing that conservatives believe in when they're not discussing immigration. The Irish did jobs that were considered lowly or dangerous, too lowly or dangerous for natives, even for slaves, who again were considered too valuable. They built roads and canals and railroads. They worked in mines. When Frederick Law Olmsted, the famous designer of New York City Central Park, once inquired about the division of labor between slaves and Irish workers on a riverboat in Alabama, he was told, quote, the niggers are worth too much to be risked here. If the patties are knocked overboard, and get their backs broke, nobody loses anything. The phrase jobs Americans won't do is taken on a negative connotation today, as if it's an insult to Americans or the Protestant work ethic. This is nonsense. Throughout history, immigrants all over the world have performed jobs that the natives spurned, whether it was Indians in South Africa, Italians in Argentina, or Turks in Germany. Not only did the Irish do jobs that were considered beneath Americans, they did jobs that were considered beneath American slaves. Irish women typically worked as domestic servants. Now, what do I mean by typically? In 1855, 99% of all domestic servants in New York City were Irish women. As late as 1920, 80% of all Irish women working in America were domestic servants. That's a snapshot of where the Irish started. Now let me give you a snapshot of where they ended up. The Irish did assimilate, of course. They produced writers and painters and presidents. They produced doctors and lawyers and school teachers. They produced civic leaders and businessmen, including Henry Ford, whose father fled the potato famine in Ireland and who would go on to revolutionize transportation in America. And according to the latest census figures, the educational achievement and household income of Irish Americans exceeds the national average. Apparently, the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of all those hard-working Irish immigrants who would never amount to anything turned out OK. And though the Irish experience has been replicated by other large immigrant groups from Europe and Asia, this history is often ignored or played down when we discuss Latino immigration today. I think the opposite should be the case. The next time you hear someone say, that Mexicans lack the skills to make it in our advanced economy, that they start off way too far down the socioeconomic ladder to ever make it here, that they will forever be stuck doing menial jobs that we don't need done anyway. Try and remember the Irish experience.
It's also sometimes argued that Latinos hang on to their native Spanish and that this is proof that they aren't assimilating. We're told that past immigrant groups quickly adopted English and that the prevalence of Spanish-speaking Latinos today is a situation that America has just never faced before. We're told that Hispanics cordon themselves off in, in barrios with their own stores and restaurants in an attempt to preserve their culture instead of adopting ours. Well, this argument is nothing new. And it's no more valid today than it was when Benjamin Franklin made it 250 years ago. Franklin complained that the German immigrants, who he called the most stupid of their nation, were too plentiful in this country. In 1751, he wrote, why should Pennsylvania, founded by the English, become a colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of us anglifying them, and who will never adopt our language and customs. Franklin was one of the most enlightened men of his day, yet on immigration he sounds like Pat Buchanan or Lou Dobbs or some conspiracy theorist. And the reason is that he was living in the middle of a wave of German immigration. In Franklin's day, 18th century America, it was possible to travel from Pennsylvania to Georgia and speak only German. The Germans had preserved their language and culture in socially enclosed enclaves strung along hundreds of miles through the Cumberland Valley, the Shenandoah Valley, and the Carolinas. Historians report that even into the 19th century, German immigrants lived largely to themselves in German-speaking communities with numerous German-language newspapers and periodicals and with their own special foods and drinks and social organizations. During the Civil War, there were all German units in the Union Army with their commands being given in German. Again, the point I'm making here is that today's immigrants from Latin America aren't really any different in terms of behavior patterns. They're just newer. America has been through all of this before. With each new wave, there's a fear that the country is being overwhelmed, that the latest immigrant group will change America more than America changes the immigrants. Of course, the Germans clearly influenced our culture. They gave us kindergarten and marching bands and Christmas trees, among other things. And I'm sure some people here today have German ancestry, but I doubt many of you speak fluent German. Let me give one last example of an argument used today to paint Latino immigrants as somehow unique. It's said that Latino immigrants are unique because of their proximity to their homeland that many come just to make money and then go back home, that many aren't interested in laying down roots and becoming Americans. By contrast, we're told thousands of miles of ocean separated prior immigrant groups from their homeland. So when they came, they came to stay and were committed to becoming American. Well, that's not what the record shows. Italian immigrants started coming in substantial numbers in the late 1880s. Like the Irish, the vast majority were desperately poor, illiterate, and had no skills of seeming value to America's industrial economy. Italians were said to have an aversion to formal education. Italy had one of the highest illiteracy rates in all of Europe, and it was particularly high in southern Italy, which is where most Italian Americans traced their ancestry. In New York, Italian labor helped build the subway system, but they were also employed as what were called rag pickers in the city dumps, and their job was to go through the city's garbage and find salvageable items. In 1910, Italian men earned less annually than either white or black men in America. Italian immigrants to the US and elsewhere also had a habit of returning home after a period. This was planned from the outset. Travel abroad, make some money, and go back home. If you run out of money, go abroad and work some more. In the immigration literature, these temporary migrants are known as sojourners. And Italian sojourners pop up all over the world. Between 1876 and 1976, around 26 million people left Italy and headed to Western Europe or the Americas. Around 8.5 million of them, or about a third, eventually returned home. About 5 million immigrants came to the U.S. between 1880 and 1930. 
Of these, two million returned to Italy. And Italians weren't the only sojourners. 46% of Hungarians went back, 36% of Slovenians, 48% of the French, 46% of the Greeks. There's a whole book about this written by a man named Mark Wyman. It's called Round Trip to America. The immigrants returned to Europe. Something like one-third of European newcomers returned home in the period leading up to World War I. Why is none of this ever discussed when people complain about Latino immigrants who want to work here for a period and then go back home? You'd think no one ever done it before. And by the way, there may not be an ocean between the U.S. and Latin America, but many Latino immigrants are, in fact, traveling thousands of miles to reach their U.S. destinations. We know their migration patterns thanks to the remittances they send back home while they're here. And those remittances show that they don't come from just across the border, which is a relatively unpopulated region. The Latino immigrants you find in Omaha, in Chicago, and Seattle, for example, typically hail from the rural Mexican state of Michoacan, which is about more than 1,500 miles from Chicago and some 2,000 miles from Seattle. Mexican immigrants in Boston tend to come from the Mexican state of Jalisco, which is well over 1,000 miles away. And those in New York often come from Puebla, a state that is more than 2,000 miles away from New York. Let's just say these immigrants aren't popping back home for weekend visits. Now, my purpose in bringing up these historical comparisons is not to argue over who had the worst experience. The point is to show that the immigrants, that the arguments against Mexican immigration today are old arguments that have been used repeatedly against previous groups. Mexicans aren't facing anything new. And history tells us that the obstacles they do face are not insurmountable. Now, I want to close with a few words about the uniqueness and success of the American assimilation model. I open the book with a quote from Ronald Reagan. It's from a speech he gave in China back in 1984. And he said, America is really many Americas. We call ourselves a nation of immigrants, and that's what we truly are. We have drawn people from every corner of the earth. We're composed of virtually every race and religion, and not in small numbers, but large. We have a statue in New York Harbor that speaks of this, a statue of a woman holding a torch of welcome to those who enter our country to become Americans. She has greeted millions upon millions of immigrants to our country. She welcomes them still. She represents our open door. All of the immigrants who came to us brought their own music, literature, customs, and ideas. And the marvelous thing, a thing of which we're proud, is that they did not have to relinquish these things in order to fit in. What they brought to America became American. And this diversity has more than enriched us. It has literally shaped us. I think Reagan articulated the uniqueness of the US assimilation model. In America, assimilation is less about immigrants adopting our culture than about immigrants adopting our values. And America has been uniquely successful in this regard, particularly in comparison to places like Europe or even Canada, which has language issues with the French. If America, or if American culture is under assault today, it's not from too many immigrants who aren't assimilating, but from modern elites who reject the concept of assimilation. For multiculturalists, particularly those in the academy, assimilation is a dirty word that elicits not just indifference, but outright hostility. Some don't want to judge one culture as superior or inferior to another. They espouse a kind of values-neutral belief system. If some societies believe in genital mutilation or keeping women undereducated or covered in a burqa, who are we to judge? Other multicultural advocates reject the assimilation paradigm outright on the grounds that the US hasn't already always lived up to its stated ideals. Americans slaughtered Indians and enslaved blacks goes this argument. And this wicked history means that we have no right to impose a value system on others. But the people who want to seal the border in response to this sort of thinking are directing their wrath at the wrong people. 
the problem isn't the immigrants, it's the multiculturalists who want to turn America into a loose federation of ethnic groups. People are right to complain about bilingual education advocacy. Anti-American Chicano studies professors, Spanish language ballots, ethnically gerrymandered voting districts, and so forth. But these problems weren't created by the woman changing linen at your hotel. I say keep the immigrants, deport the Harvard faculty. <laughs> For all the loud talk of late uh, in America, I think the public seems not to have lost confidence in the melting pot. If it had, we'd know it. There would be English-only signs everywhere, militarized border zones. There would be ubiquitous police checkpoints, far-right political parties like France's National Front. We don't have that here. Not yet. Of course, there is some bigotry and stupidity out there, which we'll always have. But when people can't really live another day with other kinds of people, they don't send emails to Bill O'Reilly. They engage in ethnic cleansing. You get Serbs and Croats in the Balkans. You get Hindus and Muslims in India. You get Hutus and Tutsis in Rwanda. What we have in America is a sort of periodic grumpiness about the most recent arrivals. A vague and ambivalent disdain that doesn't settle in too deeply to the psyche. I think most Americans still believe that our assimilationist model is working. There was a saying among the workers at Ellis Island. It went like this. The cowards never came, and the weak died on the way. And what a saying like that says to me is that America is not simply a nation of people with ancestors from other places. We're a nation of hardworking, upwardly mobile immigrant strivers. Today's immigrants aren't any different. They're just newer. I'll leave it there. Take any questions. Well, I mean, th well, th I mean, there are public benefits available to illegal immigrants. SSI food stamps aren't among them, but there are. And states can do whatever they want, practically, when it turns, comes to Medicaid and things like that. States are free to do. So public benefits do accrue to uh, illegal immigrants. Um, there, there is some truth to that. Um, but I think the, the larger question is whether there is any evidence that our welfare system is attracting immigrants. To me, that's the question. Are we a welfare magnet? We know this can happen. It's already happened in places like Europe. Um, is that, what, is, what is the evidence that the immigrants who come here are coming to go on the dole? There isn't evidence that the immigrants coming here are coming to go on the dole. And we know that based on a couple things. One, we know that based on the poor immigrants who qualify and the rates to which they sign up for the public benefits that they qualify for. They sign up at lower rates than the native poor. So that tells you something right there. We also know why they're coming based on their work record. They're overrepresented in the workforce. Underrepresented in receiving public benefits and overrepresented in the workforce. You can also look at the states they're going to when they come. I mentioned at the beginning how some states, Iowa, Arkansas, South Carolina, Tennessee, are experiencing these huge increases in their immigrant population, in their illegal immigrant population. If you were looking for handouts, you were not headed to Arkansas in America. That is not a state known for generous welfare benefits. So we know that, again, what's driving immigration based on. There is always the concern 
that there could be a, temping, a, t a tipping point at some point. It's not as if it's impossible that immigrants could start coming here one day to take advantage of our welfare state. And under this president, who is increasing the welfare state tremendously, I think that fear is greater than ever. But we still don't have hard data suggesting that that is what is driving immigration to the US. They are still coming here to, to work. And there's plenty of evidence showing that. So I think, as a conservative, I'm interested in keeping a check on the welfare state more than keeping a check on uh, the border in that regard. Because I think, as long as we have the right incentives in place, um, people will continue to come for the right reason. Uh, and right now, I think they are coming for the right reason. You guys are all elites, right? <laughs> One day. <laughs> I guess I'd, you'd have to give me a better idea of the type of person you're talking about when you say foot so I mean, there, there, are, there are different kind of, you know, there are elites on all sides of this debate. Um, Well, yeah, I, I, I think uh, the multiculturalists have an agenda, uh, and and um, immigrants serve a role. I mean, if you're a multiculturalist who you know believes that uh, the history of this country means that we shouldn't be imposing our values on other groups, um, yeah, I mean, I think it serves a purpose for other pe people to come from other countries and help you further your cause. And uh, if you happen to be a teacher uh, in a university somewhere to uh, try and indoctrinate your students to you know, share your point of view considering those things, I think, uh, yeah, you have, you have that going on. Uh, what's, what's interesting, though, for me, in terms of um, uh, the multiculturalists or, or, or the interest groups, whether it's you know, you know, MALDEF or La Raza or so forth, um, and I think you could draw a comparison here to groups like the NAACP or Urban League and so forth, is I, I don't think they represent the views of the people they claim to represent to the extent that they think they do. In other words, if you look at polls, if you, if you ask uh, one of these groups or one of these multiculturalist professors about a sub subject like bilingual education, they'll be all for it. Yeah, that's what we should be doing. You ask the parents of the kids, <laughs> If they want their children in bilingual classes or want them to learn English, they'll get a different answer. And so, you know, that's why I say if, if, if you have a problem with bilingual ballots or ethnically gerrymandered voting districts, uh, the, you know, the solution is to go after the people advocating for those sorts of things. But I guarantee you the guy who got here yesterday or five years ago is probably not among the advocates for those things. Well, I, I was trying to contrast that, and I didn't go into it uh, in enough detail, I think, uh, to answer your question, um, which is probably why you're asking it. But I was contrasting it with um, Europe, in particular, and their system, and how we've done a much better job of assimilating our immigrant populations. If you go to places like Germany and Italy and France, in France, you're either French or you're not. In Germany, you're either German or you're not. And in the Scandinavian countries even, you're either Swedish or you're not. And if you're an outsider, you know it. We don't have that mindset in this country. Uh, it's not an ethnic-based mindset or a racially-based mindset attaching the identity of the country to the race or ethnicity or religion of the person. 
And I think that is a credit to our assimilationist model. And I would contrast it with how uh, Europe's gone about doing that and the problems that have ensued, particularly in a place like France, where you have a lot of people feel very isolated. It's also because we're also able to do this. You can't separate our assimilationist model from our free market model. You can't do it. I mean, you have a very closed economy in a place like France relative to the US, closed labor markets, um, labor unions, very powerful, determining who can enter the labor market uh, and who can't. Very high barriers to entry. In the US, we have a lot of free and flexible labor market policies. Uh, and so an immigrant can come here and make a living. And, and, and that aids the assimilation process, obviously, and makes it more difficult in a place like Europe, where you know, in, in the US, laws are in place to protect the consumer. In a place like France or Italy, the laws in place, the labor laws in place, are to protect the workers who already have jobs at the expense of people who don't. And that difference in the economic model, I think, is, makes a big difference in the assimilation model. To the extent that someone can go to a new country uh, and get a job and make a living, and their kids can make a better living with a better job, that drives assimilation as well. Do I? I think that, um, that right now in America, and for an immigrant in particular, well, again, it depends on who's coming. If you're, if, 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 if you're someone coming from Mexico um, or Poland or you know, wherever, and you want to uh, start a new life here, you have every incentive to learn English. In fact, it, it amounts to a job skill that will earn you more money. Uh, so the right incentive is already in place for you to learn English. I don't think we need an English-only law for that. If you're coming from Guatemala, though, to make some money because you want to start a business back in Guatemala, and you only plan to spend a few years here, if that, you come alone, you're not bringing the wife and kids, you don't really have much incentive, or as much incentive as the previous person I described to learn English. So maybe you won't. Now, if you do have kids here, they're going to learn it. But that first generation, just like previous first generations from other groups, you know. Some did, some didn't, but generally the kids do. There might be a little more bilingual, bilingualism in the home today, but by the grandchildren, every study I've seen, the grandchildren of the first immigrant knows English, and uh, it's, it's usually the only language spoken in their home. The child of the immigrant might be bilingual, and there might be some uh, you know, of the foreign language spoken in the home, but by the, by the time you get to that, uh, the generation of the grandchild, it's an English-speaking family. And that's been, that's been the tradition uh, with other immigrant groups, and that continues to be the tradition with uh, Latino immigrants today, from everything I've seen. Yeah. Um, just to add to what you said, first of all, I want to congratulate you for many ways that you're doing that. Um, but you know, I think it's important that you're always looking at the kind of things that you're appreciating. I have a question, though. I'm a little bit curious as to whether Well, I would just encourage you to, to read the literature uh, of coming out of academia on immigration. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> And not, not just liberal elites, I should say. You know, Sam Huntington wrote a book. Uh, I, well, that's not the book I'm talking about. He wrote that, but he also wrote Who Are We? Which was, uh, uh, you know, slammed, you know, said, made the argument that Benjamin Franklin made in Pennsylvania in 1751, basically.
No, I didn't do that. Someone else. But I think that I think that the sentiment could be rightly referred to some of the things you have to say. And I wonder whether people gravitate culturally, multiculturally, whether their position isn't necessarily one of seeking to <coughs> limit what one narrative of assimilation can be. In other words, whether whether it's really there's a group of people who think that America has no right to impose its values on others, or whether there's a, a group of people who simply are more tolerant of a, of a certain degree of cultural difference. Well, there, there, my argument is that you, you have, uh, I think, I guess I break it down into three or four strains, uh, separate arguments about immigrants. You have, you have a group of people, um, uh, you have economic protectionists. You have, you know, the labor unions, people who believe in jobs being stolen and wages being depressed by immigrants, and then just think we need to um, close off our labor markets to foreign workers. Uh, and these people, you know, high end, low end. They don't want any H one B visa caps lifted. They, they, you know, the, the Chinese engineers are stealing uh, jobs as well as uh, day laborers from from uh, from El Salvador. So you have that. You have the economic. Uh, um, restrictionists um, or the, the protectionists, I'd call them. Then you have a, a political strand here, um, a, just a sort of um, heartless political operative mentality where um, they're going to be Democrats, so we got to keep them out. We're just importing votes for the other side. This makes no sense. And they're opposed on those grounds. Um, and then you have, I think, these social conservatives who worry that we're not Americanizing people the way we used to. And there is something to that argument in the sense that there are more of these uh, elites in academia today. Um, the, 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 those, those people in academia that I'm describing weren't always there. I mean, this is really a product of a sort of post-60s mentality when it came to the left taking over and, and advocating in the way that they that we know today that your generation thinks of you know life on campus and and professors and and their activism and so forth that's really a post 60s phenomenon um, uh, but but there is something to this view that you know if 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 you have ballots in english and french and german and spanish um, you know what does that say what is the message that sends to newcomers What's that? You can make it so everyone can vote. That's the message it sends? So. Could it also send a message that learning English isn't a priority? Or that while one is learning English, it's still a Democrat citizen. I'm just saying that you can interpret it in different ways. There's 126 languages. Mm -hmm. I think it's a Los Angeles County South Dallas, yeah. Los Angeles County. Yeah. And those people are all, as you say, they're working here. And, and what message do ethnically gerrymandered voting districts? Uh, send. Oh, I'm with you. I'm with you that the state houses across the country are rigged on our districts. Oh, I mean, I mean, but the, these are the types of things that weren't in place when the Irish were coming and the Germans were coming and and so forth. Uh, that that is that is a difference, and 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 so uh, and bilingual education and so forth. And so, I don't buy the argument that it's it's. It's it's a strong. I don't think it's a strong enough argument to reduce immigration, but I can't dismiss it out of hand. There there are there are fewer efforts today to assimilate immigrants than there used to be. I don't think there's. I don't think that's really up for debate. Now whether you know there are so few efforts that we need to seal the border like some people uh, that gives me pause but I don't doubt that there are fewer efforts today than there used to be to Americanize people um, you know. so I, um, I certainly appreciate yeah. I think in every space and in the knowledge yeah. base on this uh, the fact that I agree with it uh, I would imagine that that is something that probably resonates more with let's say a Stanford crowd um, and I wonder when you go to um, those communities, like in Iowa, for example, that are facing increased immigration, the first line is sort of a, a, a 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, what what you get from uh, a lot of these places um, uh, that aren't used to uh, to uh, immigrants, um, I think you get a, you get a law and order argument out of them, particularly if illegal immigration is increasing in these places, um, and and they'll say, well, you know, my ancestors came legally, and my problem now whether this whether this is a, a disingenuous argument or not, I can't look into someone's heart and tell. But what they will say is, you know, my problem is not that they're here. My problem is that they came illegally, they broke the law, we're a nation of laws, and they go on from there. Um, uh, so I get, I get, you get more of that uh, from a lot of these places. Um, um, you also get, though, you know, you know, why do I have to press one for English? Why does my kid go to school with so many kids who speak a different language? This is all, this is all new. Why have all the street signs on the main drag? You know, you know, why are half of them in a different language now? You get that. And yeah, if you if you you know, come from a place on the coast, or, you know, or if you're from Texas or Arizona, you've been used to this for a long time. It's it's new. Although I will tell you, I, I used to sit at my desk in in my office in New York, and. Uh, write something in the paper and get phone calls from someone in San Diego saying, you know, Jason, you obviously have no idea what it's like to, um, you know, uh, see Spanish signs all over the, the grocery store or something. I'm saying, you realize you're calling New York City? <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you know, some people don't think outside of the box, uh, even on the coast. Um, but yeah, I, you tend to get more of the... Um, of the, of the law and order. And then, and then as I started the speech with, what happens is I say, uh, you're right. People should be coming legally. And they would come legally if they had more legal ways to come. So let's do that. And then they switch. Then they go, well, I, you, know, the, you know, do we really need, you know, you know we, 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 we're overpopulating the U.S. or we're, you know, the, the, you know, we have to worry about terrorists. We have to do, the, then the, the goalposts shift. I mean, because addressing the illegal problem, I don't think is uh, that tough to do. I, I, I mean, I think, you know, most of the people who come don't want to sneak across. They have no need, no desire to sneak across. They'd much rather be in the above ground economy. Um, you know, you let them use the front door, they'll use it. Uh, that's been the, you know, the experience, uh, so. Do you mean in terms of why, why they want to come here instead of? No, my point is that it's, it's a it's a very simple living country that has a, a bundle of attributes that we might consider less desirable. At what at what relative population level do you think of them? What race is that? Where people say, you know what, I don't want to go to the United States, even though it has. Well, I, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I don't, I don't, that to me, and people who think they do know the answer to that are engaging in Soviet-style central planning of economic markets. I mean, I have no idea how many immigrants this, this country needs. I have no idea how many electricians we need, how many plumbers we need. I have no idea what the right price of gas should be or what a quart of milk should cost. 
The market determines this. Supply and demand determines this. This is economics 101. Now, you had people in other countries, and we have volumes full of experiences, often, always, ending badly, in which smart people try to sit down in a room and, and determine the answers to these questions on their own. We don't do that in this country. And I think that has a lot to do with why we're the richest, most powerful nation that's ever existed. I don't want to start trying to manage our, our, our markets that way. Sitting in a room and saying, hmm, I'm looking at Florida. Looks like the unemployment rate there is this. So they obviously don't need any more workers. Um, I've looked at Intel's books. It doesn't seem to me that they need any more engineers at that, at that company. So we're not going that's, to. That's not America. That's not, uh, I think, a recipe for economic growth. I mean, if, if, if and, and it's part of the immigration debate going on in Washington right now is setting up a commission to try and do just this sort of thing. To say to Marriott, mm, we don't think you need uh, to build another hotel or that, you know, the, the demand isn't there. Uh, you don't need any more chambermaids or you can't recruit. I mean, in, in America, it's not as if Marriott goes out and builds a hotel that sits empty and then they go ask the government for workers to fill it. The hotel never gets built. I mean, that's, it's the difference between a central, centrally planned economy and a free market economy. And I think the free market is the way to go. I mean, people worry about uh, whether the country is slouching towards Guatemala because of all the Latinos. I'm worried about our economy slouching towards France in terms of uh, you know, top-down controls of our labor market. Okay, I'll buy that. Right. Right. And if we make sure that people continue to come for the right reasons, they also won't come for the right reasons, which is why when the economy is soft, we get fewer immigrants. It, that's, that's been the history. In fact, there are some economists that say migration patterns at the border are a leading economic indicator. That's how finely tuned the immigrants are to the labor markets in the US. Where to go, which cities have the jobs, which states have the jobs, which industries need the workers. There are economists that can tell you how the economy is doing by cross-border traffic. Our immigrants come for the right reasons. I want to make sure that continues. Sure. You, you could, um, oh, I'd say capital. But you, you could um, mechanize uh, certain services in the US. Um, uh, or you could try and incentivize companies to do that. But you have to remember, we're in a global economy here. So in other words, if you look at an industry like agriculture, I'm of the opinion that either foreigners are going to come here and pick the crops, or foreigners are going to pick the crops in their own country, and we're going to import them. And I'd rather the work be done here, because the surrounding work will probably be done by natives, packaging the food, marketing the food, driving the food somewhere. So, but if you lose the worker, if you lose the labor in the field, you lose that outside economic activity as well. So I'd rather the crop be picked here. But if it's not picked here, um, we'll survive. But I don't think it's going to be because you're going to go pick it, or your kids are going to go pick it. And, and, and I don't think that Dole Foods or some other big agribusiness is going to pay someone $50,000 to pick cotton in the Yuma Sun. It's not going to happen. Instead, that job is going to be outsourced. It's going to that job is gone. It's not as if. Immigrants, and that's why when I say supply creates its own demand, it's not as if um, the jobs that immigrants are doing today 
would simply be filled with Americans if they all up and left tomorrow. Those jobs, in many cases, would no longer exist in the country. Now, you can determine whether we would be better off or worse off because of that. And we can argue about that. But we cannot assume that if we could magically make every immigrant disappear or leave tomorrow, that all the jobs they're currently filling would continue to exist. I think that's highly doubtful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.